All right, we will get started. I'm looking, Macrina, are you there? Is she here yet? Yes, I'm here. There you are, okay. I've been here for a while. Oh, well, you beat me, I guess. I did for the first time ever. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm usually late to parties, so. All right, well, it's noon. I'm gonna say, let's get started. So happy June. 16th, everyone. We are halfway through the year, believe it or not. It is flying by as they always do. Um, I'm Rebecca Nevadale with, with the Arizona Partnership for Immunizations, or TAPI. Um, and today is June 16th, 2022. So if you're watching a recording of this webinar, some of this information might be out of date. So you're going to want to double check things on CDC's website, that's cdc.gov. And you can always look at Tappy's website too at whyimmunize.org for the latest up-to-date information. We're going to talk a little bit about COVID vaccine today. So that stuff especially might be out of date by the time you're watching this. Um, Macrina is also on from Maricopa County, fresh from uh, Switzerland. And where else did you go? Switzerland, France, and New York City. Yes. Yeah, so there's a running joke. For those of you who've been around TIPS for a long time, whenever Macrina leaves the country, there's an outbreak. And we tested that again. And don't you know it, monkeypox showed up in Maricopa County when she left the country. So we will go a big shout out to the rest of the county nursing team who um, it had to work on that response while Macrina was in Lucerne and drinking wine and then uh, at Central Park. So. No more leaving the country. Sorry, Macrina. Well, I will bring this back up when we get further into the presentation because <laughs> there's a reason why you don't, you're, you should be the only person who knows how to do things in your organization. This is true. Okay, so uh, we're going to dive into COVID. Uh, I'm confused, Macrina about these little kids, um, but it's very exciting. I think you've all seen on the news, the FDA has done some EUA uh, approvals over the last few days for the last age group um, to get uh, become eligible for COVID vaccine, but give us the lowdown, Macrina. Okay, so it is kind of confusing. There's not a lot of official information out there, but what I was able to get from the FDA website was, the, I think the most important piece of this is that the Pfizer for, is ages six months through four years, up to five, and Moderna um, six months through um, five years, up to six, is planned um, to receive, it has received FDA approval. The EUAs are in the, which is the emergency use authorizations are in the process of being written up um and ready to move but we cannot back we cannot administer any vaccine until the cdc and the acip meet and give their final recommendation um and so they are meeting june 17th and 18th on friday and saturday so by probably close of business on the 18th if anyone has vaccine and after cdc gives their official um recommendation then we can start administering vaccine and as you all know that parents who have been waiting for months and months and months are probably calling your office right now because the news on the street is it's FDA approved, but we need to wait. This is the information that, that we have so far from the FDA website is that Pfizer, again, six months through four years of age, up to five, which I know this is going to get confusing between Pfizer and Moderna, um, but Pfizer is going to ship. The same way Pfizer vaccine currently ships, it's gonna be um, ultra cold and you can leave it ultra cold for up to 12 months. You do not freeze this vaccine. So, but don't worry, if you don't have an ultra cold freezer, you can put it in your refrigerator, two to eight degrees Celsius or 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit, just like all your other refrigerated vaccines. And you can start up there for 10 weeks. Again, like your others, it can be at room temperature which is going to be 36 to about 77 degrees for 12 hours. Um, and just like um, the other vaccine, once you puncture the vial, it's only good for 12 hours. You need to use those doses. 
This one is going to have a different color cap. So it's going to be a maroon cap. So you'll be, easy, um, be a little bit easier to um, distinguish it from the purple cap. I have not seen the maroon cap, so I don't know how maroon it is. Um, this is going to be a three microgram dose, um, 0.2 mils. You're going to dilute this vaccine with 2.2 mils of diluent. It is going to have a new NDC code. Um, it's going to be packaged in 10 dose vials with 10 vials per box for 100 doses per box. And you will receive ancillary kits along with this as well, one inch needles because it is IM and the diluent. We don't have that NDC code yet though, huh? I have not seen it. I haven't either. Um, we'll check if we get it um, soon, we'll make sure to email it out to you guys. Um, and we're ordering this through ACES. So this is being ordered through ACES. You do not need to go through your county health department. Now, there was some information and this is going to get confusing. So this is just an FYI and a warning. Um, but some of the box and vials may say two years to five or six months to five. It may say one or the other. The vials that say two to five can be used for children six months to four years. Hope there should be in your shipment a statement that says that. Um, so this is just a warning that that may happen. Um, the vaccine vials may also state that after you um, puncture, that it's only good for six hours after dilution, which is after the first puncture, but it will be good for 12 hours post dilution. And whole, again, if this information should be within that shipping packet. Okay, so Moderna is six months through five years, a little bit different. Um, it's going to arrive um, negative 20, just like your Moderna does now. Um, you can store it in a freezer or you can store it in the refrigerator for 30 days. Again, um, two, to, two to eight degrees centigrade or 36 to 46 um, Fahrenheit. Again, it's good at room temperature for up to 12 hours um, prior to puncture. Once you puncture it, um, this can get a little confusing. So if you have it at room temperature for two hours and you puncture the vial, the vial is only going to be good for 10 additional hours at room temperature once it's punctured. So you've got to sort of think that through. Um, they will have a blue cap with a magenta border. This dose is 25 micrograms, which is going to be a 0.25 mil. Um, it also will have a new NDC. You do not need to dilute this vaccine. Again, it's gonna be 10 dose vials, 10 vials per box, a minimum of 100 um, doses. And ancillary kit, ancillary supplies will be provided as well as when we as we can rely on. And on another note, and I, we could find no not very much information, but we do know that the FDA has approved Moderna for 12 years to 17 years, and that is two 100 microgram doses follows the adult dosing and schedule. And they also approved it for six years to 11 years. And that is two 50 dose microgram doses, which is the same as um, the booster dose for Moderna. Again, more information to follow um, this is just a really good guess on my part, but I'm thinking that they will review the ACIP will review this data and that you will receive emergency use authorization information and guidance from CDC on this once they meet, once their meeting is over on Saturday. So there's lots of stuff that you might see or hear. I mean, I'm seeing things on listservs about are we using the same product for six to 11 or all, the end of the day. You, we're, right now we're in a holding pattern as we have been every time we've opened up to a new age group. So we're just gonna all have to patiently wait for ASIP to meet uh, and they will be the ones that tell us which product, um, you know, that give you the final recs on dosage, ages, product presentation. 
Um, but this is what we know to expect. And thanks, McLena, too, for um, adding that into the chat that we are expecting. Just heads up, FYI, um, at some point, we'll probably have a third dose of Moderna as well. And uh, you may want to think about that as you consider which products to offer your patients to. So, uh, you know, that right now it will be probably a two dose recommendation for Moderna. That's what we're hearing it will be. But eventually they'll probably be calling those people back in. Well, and, and just, and I, and I, this, and this is really probably the most confusing time for all of us because not only are we just, not only are we not just changing, let's say, a single vaccine, but we're changing two vaccines, we're updating two vaccines with a total of four age, four age groups. So I think this final rollout of vaccine for an additional age group is probably the most confusing we've had. So I guess just, you know, hang on, we're all going to get through this and we're all going to be panicking on Monday or Tuesday together. Yeah. Trying to hurry, trying to hurry and read everything because we know we have, we have parents waiting in line. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a couple questions too about how much, you know, are patients going to be able to get the vaccine out in the community if you're not already planning to offer this? So we did do a survey last month on tips and we found that overwhelming majority of you all are planning to offer this um, to your patients. We do not expect a ton of practices will invite other people's patients into their practice for the vaccine, you know. Um, the counties will, we expect to provide that to whoever goes to their county sponsored events, um, that they'll be able to offer the vaccine to the whole population. Uh, but please plan on vaccinating your own patient population. Uh, we do not expect this is going to be a huge rush like we saw when we went down to age five. Um, we think we'll probably be able to knock out those eager families the first few weeks. Uh, with a mix of you all offering it to your patients, the FQHCs handling their patients, uh, and then the counties being able to offer it to um, kind of the safe, be the safety net for folks who don't have access to it. But um, it's the hard work is going to be in the next few months as you're getting these patients before they go into daycare or in childcare, before they... Um, you know, just coming in for their well visits and having those conversations with families. A lot of parents oh, are not going to ask this or are not going to um, look for this right away. They're going to still need to be think about it. So, all right. So, um, all right. Any, does anybody have questions or other things about that before we move on about the COVID stuff? Let me make sure I, um, Oh, it looks like somebody's chatting me the um, NDC code. So I'll make sure to put those in here. Um, there's no reason to believe that we will not, we, you'll be able to co-administer this, I'm sure, with other vaccines, right, Macrina? Um, you know, the ACIP hasn't met, and I think the ACIP yeah. is going to be the one to make that decision. Cool. Um, so I'm Thanks, cautiously optimistic that they will co-administer. Yeah. We, we will all we will all know um, Saturday evening. So yeah. if you're all waiting and you can't find anything to do Saturday night, then just go to the <laughs> CDC ASA site and read up. There we go. All right. So um, go ahead and use that chat if you have other questions or just kind of thoughts or um, if you need some, if you need to freak out, um, oh, another product, another cap color, go ahead. We're, we're all here to commiserate with you. Um, but really excited that we're entering into this this last age group. So so the last couple of months we've been meeting once a month and we're talking about all things vaccines, how you screen patients for contraindications, how you talk with families and patients about vaccines, how you administer vaccines. Uh, at the end of the day, what gets shots into arms is your team, is your processes that are going to help support a vaccine um, program in your office, your team's ability to answer questions of your patients, 
to go the extra mile and and honestly just to do kind of the stupid little stuff that makes a really huge difference in getting your coverage rates up. And we talked last month about our uh, cloud award winners. So those are practices that have achieved 90% coverage for their teens and or their toddlers. They all received an award a few months ago from Tappy. Um, it's a huge monumental feat to get 90% coverage. I know that it looks like our friends at Canton Pediatrics are on the line um, today. They got it for the first time this year. So congrats to them. Um, but we also heard here from people that 90% is just too high of a goal for you right now, given where you're starting. And we want to make sure that you realize um, we are here to support you too. And 90% coverage is obviously the goal, but you know your community. Uh, you know what, what's happening in your practice. And for many of us, we, we aren't going to go from 60% coverage to 90% coverage right away. So today we actually asked Dr. Clarissa Smith from Yavapai Pediatrics. They're a practice who didn't quite get the cloud award, uh, but has made just major improvements in their coverage rates. And we asked Dr. Smith if she'd sign on and just talk with us about how you make sure all of your folks are covered. So I'm going to actually stop sharing the screen here because I think that you're usually good at putting your camera on. Yep, there, there it is. <laughs> I'm here, yeah. yeah. Hi, so we well, thank you for great. having me. Yeah. So first of all, I'll introduce myself. I know Sherry did. I'm Clarissa. I'm uh, the pediatrician. I started my own practice, Yavapai Pediatrics, in 2013, um, and I have been in Prescott Valley since 2011. Um, we have a small practice, it's myself, and then I have a part-time NP and PA, so I work um, with both of them on a regular basis. Um, in 2015, we initiated a vaccine policy, which I think has helped significantly. We do mandate vaccines for our patients, and if they choose to follow an alternative vaccination schedule or choose not to vaccinate, then we prefer that they seek care elsewhere. Um, we did that for a couple reasons. Number one, I think if I was the only shop in town, I'd probably would not have done that. Um, but there's other options for them in the community. Um, and so if parents choose not to vaccinate, they can go there. The other reason is obviously, um, I am a big proponent as most pediatricians are, I would say, um, of vaccines. And I believe they are safe, effective and provide just, um, you know, they're probably the best invention of this century and, or last century. <laughs> Um, but still ongoing. But And so I felt like if parents trusted me and believed in vaccines that we were on the same page. Um, and then the third reason was also time. You know, as pediatricians, we see 20, 30, 40 patients a day and um, arguing with patients or trying to convince them to get vaccines and having those conversations, especially those that are, I feel like come to argue was just, I felt like a big waste of my time. And I did not think that, um, when they called and they wanted to be new patients, we tell them immediately of our vaccine policy. And that way we're not in those. Um, I mean, I still have those conversations with some two month old parent, two month old baby parents that um, they're still kind of there. They had second thoughts about it and, but it's much less. And so that I think saves time. Um, it allows me to spend more time with my patients for more important reasons and also um, see more patients and provide more resources for our community. Um, so when we went, you would think we would have 100%, right, with our vaccine policy, or with our vaccine policy, but we're not at 100%. And most of that is also because of more paperwork, right? So I think number one is making sure that those patients that are enrolled with your practice in ACES are enrolled with your practice. And so that's one thing that we kind of set out to do um, every year is just kind of review those to make sure that we clear out patients that are no longer with us. And so if your practice is, uh, I guess, hosting or um, labeled as the primary care provider for patients that are no longer being seen in your clinic, you're gonna get dinged for them if they're not up to date, whether they've moved or transferred practices because they don't vaccinate or because for some other reason, if you're not staying on top of those lists, then you are gonna have a lower, um, number. You know, obviously another reason why we kind of struggled was with COVID. You know, we had some patients that weren't coming in for their well visits, despite us recommending well visits in the setting of COVID. But 
we also lost patients that just didn't want to do COVID and were so anti-COVID and so anti-mask, they didn't want to even come in because we were requiring masks, which we still are. And I'm sure most of the practices are. Um, you know, I tell parents that we will continue to wear masks as long until, you know, our patients can be protected. And a lot of our patients are under six months of age. So even with the six month vaccine coming out, we have a lot of patients that can't be protected. And so the only way for us is to do it, um, wear masks. Um, the other thing is that when we see patients on every visit, we check ACEs, every visit. So if we're giving, you know, 15 month vaccines at a 16 month ear infection visit, we're doing it. Um, we check ACEs for everyone. And so the way we do that is we chart prep the day before. Well, I don't, I guess my staff does, <laughs> um, but my MAs and nurses will um, chart prep the day before. They will go into ACEs for everyone. And, you know, and it's as easy as they make little stickies and they put them together and they have that ready for the next day. And when they find that someone's missing vaccines, they'll actually change their appointment um, description in the, in the EMR. And it'll say like sore throat, star, a little asterisk, missing, you know, 12 month vaccines. Um, that doesn't happen very often because we have started to kind of make sure that people are coming in for their well visits, but we do check ACEs every time. Um, and then we have a few that, you know, are from out of state or something, and we really urge parents to send us their vaccine records as soon as possible. And then we have a list that we catch up with. So we'll, um, we'll keep track of that list and um, we'll have a list. And if with, by the end of the month, we haven't been contacted with parents, we'll reach out to them again and kind of ask them for their vaccine records. So those are, I would say, the biggest things that we do to encourage um, our patients to remain vaccinated and get vaccinated and to stay at those higher percentage points. Um, I think that recalls are important and I know I mean, I, we sure are, but I know practices are suffering right now with keeping staff, keeping staff or being fully staffed with, um, I don't know what it is. I feel like these people should be back at work, but they just don't want to work. It's so frustrating. Um, and so, yeah, so sometimes, um, you know, I've trained my daughter to do it. She's 13. <laughs> she comes to the office a couple of times a week, especially during the summer. And that's one of the things she does. Um, she signs a HIPAA, she has a whole, uh, we trained her and she knows what's private and she signed her own HIPAA thing and she does it. So, I mean, we just really try to find ways around kind of not overwhelming our staff with a lot of busy work, but also just making sure we're on top of it. Um, we are big proponents in the community for vaccine. Um, for the COVID vaccine, I started in January when the vaccine first came out of 2021 and offered drive up vaccines for everyone. And so I have for the last 18 months been vaccinating the entire community, not just my patients. We just stopped June 1st, um, burnt out. <laughs> and we now will only be vaccinating our patients as, um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, I'm sending the others to the health department. But for a long time, we were vaccinating everyone. I mean, I had 80 year olds driving up to my clinic getting vaccines, but um, I think if it's something that you feel strong about, that is, there's a way around it. You know, the way we did that is I did that. I did those vaccines because I did not have the staff to do them. And so that was something that I felt was uh, something I could do for the um, community. So that's kind of my, um, I guess, spiel in a nutshell. So I wanted to kind of um, open it up for questions and also see if there were challenges that you guys had and maybe how we worked around them or we could brainstorm together how you can work around them now. No questions? <laughs> Might be a short meeting. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I do. I think that anyone feel free to like unmute your lines. Cause I know that a lot of you are kind of wrestling through, um, how to get that kind of last critical mass of your patients. If you're chasing down that cloud award, I, I actually am wondering, are you requiring, um, COVID vaccine as well now, or how are you? So we actually have three vaccines that we don't require. 
And so number one, well, COVID, we don't require it. Number two is the flu vaccine. Um, I wish I could, it's very difficult to require the flu vaccine. Um, and then hepatitis B, um, sorry, I lied. It's four, because COVID's the fourth one, um, and HPV. And the reason we don't require those is for my reasoning is that I tell parents that I require vaccines is that I wanna protect the children in my office from those, of those particular um, infections, right? Those illnesses. And I cannot say how someone could spread Hep B in my office. <laughs> um, the nurses obviously have Hep B, so if there's a needle stick, yes, but um, they have the vaccine, so they're required. But um, Hep B can't really be spread through like just touch and respiratory droplets and so forth, and HPV same way. So, so those are the things that I have not included in my vaccine policy. Um, I don't have anyone that I know of that I can think of that has refused hepatitis B. Um, I do have quite a bit of HPV. And, you know, we talk to parents, we encourage parents, we educate parents. That is when we do really try to get vaccinated. It's been difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Denise is putting in the chat a reminder that hep B is required for school. So that's certainly working to your advantage, right? Yeah, it's yeah. working to my advantage. And I mean, really, in life, they're going to need hep B. Right. no matter what they do at one point in their life. I mean, I just had my good friend, he's a dentist in the community. He's like, hey, I need to get my staff Hep B, you know, vaccinated. A lot of them aren't fully vaccinated for Hep B. Like, can you help me with that? And I'm like, sure, I'll help you. But he's panicking because he's now getting like reviewed or something and <laughs> his staff's not all fully vaccinated. Yeah. So I ordered him a bunch of vaccines and I helped to vaccinate his staff and, and we'll see them back again in a couple months to do the second and third series. And there's a, how many staff members did you say you have? So we currently have three front office staff, three back office staff, and um, one office manager, and then the three providers. We typically function at our best with five back office staff. So we're about too short right now. Mm -hmm. And that's really been difficult. Um. So Jessica is asking, she's intrigued by the idea of volunteers. It looks, it sounds like that's what Kingman Regional calls it. Um, so what exactly does your daughter do? <laughs> so my daughter does, um, so she sends like, she'll check ACES and do those chart preps. So we have, well, I can't really show you, but like we have this pa a packet, um, this is not, I don't want to show it because it has patient information. So I'll kind of back up. So we have this packet that, that we give to parents at their well visits. And um, and we'll prep those every day with their well visits and we'll write their name on it. And it has their height, weight percentiles that we'll fill out when they get here. And then the sticky goes on it. And the sticky usually has, um, we have pre-printed stickies that have like, you know, weight, height, you know, um, head circumference. And then it has like a couple other things, you know, meds and the nurses use that to kind of jot down. And so my daughter fills out this sticky with that information and she puts it on the chart. And so the only thing she really has to look up is ACEs. So she'll look up ACEs and look at the vaccines. Um, she has a cheat sheet vaccine schedule that we give her. So she knows what it looks like. And she's actually doesn't use it anymore because she she knows the vaccine schedule. Uh, she knows what they need by what age. And she knows also how to look at the bottom of ACEs that shows what, what they're missing. You know, how it has at the bottom of your vaccine record, like which ones are missing and which ones are due. So she'll do that. Mm -hmm. And so if she knows that they're coming in for a four month checkup and it says they're missing their four month vaccines, she just writes four month vaccines. Um, for the non-well visits, she does the same thing. On the sticky, she does, you know, again, the shorthand so that the nurses can just use the sticky to write stuff down with. Um, they walk around with tablets, but sometimes it's just, they feel like it's easier just to write stuff down. And then same thing, she'll check ACEs and see if there's anything that they're missing. Um, and she usually refers again to the missing section at the bottom, but then just double checks and stuff like that. Um, and so, so that's what she does in terms of chart prep. The other, um, and in terms of vaccines, other things my daughter does is she actually um, will scan and send um, EPSDTs to access for us. In fact, can put those together in a PDF so that they can be scanned. And um, they're already, sorry, she scans them. She puts them together in a combo file for PDF and then faxes them over to um, each of the access sites. Um, sometimes she'll scan and, 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 
put chart uh, documents and charts and stuff like that. So a lot of like, you know, all uh, the VFC forms, you know, the right. eligibility forms, you know, she files those to charts and stuff like that. So just a busy work that tends to kind of get put on the back burner and, and do that. That's great. And as a, you know, you're the business owner, so you can make decisions. Yeah. And I, so I, I would, if you're thinking, wow, that would be really good for our team, talk to your practice manager about, you know, I'm sure doc, Dr. Smith's great at, she'll talk to an, uh, one of her colleagues if you need, if it would be helpful for you to talk about how you might be able to use a volunteer or, um, or somebody else who, I, I like that your 13 year old daughter can remember the schedule. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's you know you we like to would be surprised sometimes. Many of many of your colleagues don't know the schedule, so that's really amazing. Um, well, and you guys would be surprised how tech savvy these kids are. Mm -hmm. I mean, they picked up my EMR so quick. I mean, she when we were super um, behind, she would come to work and she would like help room patients and she wouldn't do vitals or anything like that, but she would run like COVID tests and strep tests. And she, you know, wow. I know I'm lucky to have her, but yeah, uh, Very. yeah. she can't wait till she turns 14. So she could actually get hired and get paid because <laughs> in yeah, the state of Arizona, you can start working at 14. And so we'll put her on the payroll. <laughs> there you go. It, it is neat. And for those of you who are owned by larger systems, like the hospital system or something, maybe there is some sort of other volunteer program or something that you just, they haven't thought to tell ambulatory about yet. Um, there's quite a few comments in here about staffing being a big problem. Um, I don't know where these people are at either. It's a problem in our friends in oral health care in behavioral health and in primary, primary care. Um, Lots of people, or there's some comments in here about having to spend time doing catch-up vaccines. Um, yes, we will send a recording. Every um, Some thanks to you for doing your drive-up vaccines. And a shout out from Susie for Partners for Healthy Students. Is oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long do you take on a well visit? Um, so my staff does the EPSDT, so they usually take about 20, um, depending if they're a new patient or not, 20, 30 minutes to room them. And then I go in and see them. And while I'm seeing them and just kind of going over anticipatory guidance, doing my exam and addressing parental concerns, they're drawing up the vaccines. And that's another thing where I feel like um, saves time with having a vaccine policy is that, you know, if they're coming in, they're getting their vaccines. You know, they're getting their mm -hmm. vaccines. We get them drawn up. We get them ready to go. We don't have to wait for me to tell them, okay, they are going to do vaccines. There's a rare instance where a kid comes in and we have all had that where parents say that, you know, they have a fever, they're sick and they don't want to do vaccines, but they'll come back next week and I'll allow that. I do. And I've never had a parent not show up in the next week or two to do their vaccines. It's extreme. I don't think, I can't think of it. I just had one today that was sick last week and she came in today for her vaccines. Um, but you know, you know, she was in the office, feeling crummy, had a fever, having a chew. You know, I tell I tell them all the time that that's not a contraindication, but but it's still, you know, it's kind of mean. Yeah. <laughs> they, they feel crummy, and then you're poking them. Like it's yeah. okay to wait a week. So, so yeah, I um, I would say that saves time too, because my staff knows they're just gonna um, go ahead and start drawing up vaccines and getting them done. Right. Um, Zachary is putting in their nursing students would be good too. And if you've used those, Zachary, it would be great if you could chat in some information, like do RNs need an RN on, RN students need an RN on site or would they be able to be? No, so, so anyone, I mean, anyone, any MA, nursing assistant, um, uh, non-certified person can administer vaccines if they are trained and supervised by a licensed provider. Wow. Um, so, and let me correct that licensed medical doctor. Mm -hmm. So under an NP or PA's license, a non MA cannot administer vaccines. Okay. So for a long time, one of our MAs was actually transitioned from our front office and we trained her to do back office but I'm not in the office on Wednesdays. So she couldn't administer vaccines on Wednesdays. She could only administer vaccines 
when I was in the office. So if I was on vacation, she could draw them up, get them ready, and then she would, you know, verify them with another um, MA or nurse. But she has since gotten her MA certification. She did it online on her own. And so that's not a problem anymore. But you can train anyone under a medical doctor. If there is a medical doctor under our license, it, it is um, you can administer vaccines, but you are accepting that risk, you know, yeah. but if you train them and you feel confident with them, you can do that. I mean, I think sometimes we, we forget how competent certain people can be if they've given the proper training mm -hmm. and we need to have faith in them and you can find those people, you know, and that's why I transitioned our, she's actually our VFC coordinator now on AE and she um, transitioned. She started with me from the very beginning as one of my best front office people. And um, I found it easier to find front office staff than it was to find back office staff. So then I transitioned her to the back office. Oh, wow. So. Cool. Um, Denise wants to talk with you after. So we'll make sure Denise that we hook <laughs> you up with Dr. Smith. Um, and is reminding us a doc does have to be in the building to give vaccines. And Zachary's saying he used, um, they use the nursing students, but an RN has to be on site. So if you have RNs that, or maybe even NPs, you know, talk to nursing schools, if you would like a connection, we can certainly try to connect you um, with them. We work with some, with uh, the nursing schools on different vaccine advocacy things. So um, Dr. Smith, thank you so much. Um, thank you, guys. This is really, it's its always great to have you give very practical things, like do this thing, because uh, <laughs> it is the stupid little stuff a lot of times, right? Oh, um, it is. Yeah. And it gets, it gets frustrating. I understand. We've been there. We've done that, you know, but it's, you know, it's kind of the name of the game. And we're able to provide a resource for our community that's invaluable. And so you just kind of ultimately, we have to go back to why we did this and being altruistic, <laughs> which often is forgotten when you are getting frustrated with parents that can be difficult. <laughs> yes. And they're not trying to be, they're trying to keep their babies no. healthy and safe. We know that, yeah. but it, but it is a lot. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we will be sure to um, hook anybody who wants to be hooked up uh, with um, with Dr. Smith, just let us know and we'll send an email intro. Uh, and just one more question. Do you give vaccines just to your pediatric patients or do you do the whole family that just came in too? And oh, I know we, we, for billing purposes, we only do um, our patients. Like cool. I said, for COVID, it was different. I was trying mm -hmm. to be a resource for the community. I felt like that. I didn't have the time to go and volunteer at like, you know, and it was too far to go volunteer at this state farm or do those kind of right. things. And so I thought, hey, this is the way I could do it. I can figure this out. And I did it. So. Well, thanks. It saved a whole lot of lives doing that. I hope so. I hope so. Because <laughs> you have a lot of the that population who we really needed access to vaccine in your community. So thank you. Well, and I was the only one doing drive ups. And so that was so nice for some of these older people that couldn't even like it was so difficult for them to just get out of their car. And yeah. Yeah. And State Farm is a drive away. So. Um, so we are going to move on to storage and handling, which is not as exciting as hearing from one of your colleagues about how they uh, <laughs> how they they make sure their patients are vaccinated. But at the end of this, we are gonna put in the chat a link to an evaluation. And we're wondering if anyone else would be interested in kind of having five or 10 minutes to just share some things that you've learned and best practices in a future webinar. If you think you might be interested in that or get your doc or your VFC coordinator to do something like Dr. Smith just did, take that evaluation and we will be sure to, I, to hook up with you afterwards and figure out what you can talk about. Macrina, tell us about the cold chain. This is Macrina's least favorite thing, by the way, to talk about about vaccines is this, cold chain and storage and handling. This is probably the most important piece. I know. After everything we've talked about, trying to talk to parents, convince parents, ask answer the questions, answer the misinformation questions, um, corral a five year old with a therapeutic hold who needs several vaccines. Um, after you've done all of that, you really need to make sure that the vaccine has been stored and handled appropriately so that we're giving a vaccine that's going to work. Um, 
but again, it's like the boringest, driest piece of all of this. Okay, so the cold chain starts and it's vaccine manufacturing. Everybody who touches a, a vaccine dose are responsible for their part of the cold chain. Um, so it starts with vaccine manufacturing to distribution. Um, once it shows up at your office, it's that front office person who signs for the delivery. And so now they're part of the cold chain because they need to make sure they know the right person to contact and make sure it gets unpacked and put away properly. And all the way down to vaccine administration. Um, and who do we need trained in the cold chain? So I believe everyone should be trained in the cold chain, maybe not 100% of it, but that person at the front desk needs to know how important that vaccine is when it arrives and it's not something that can be put under the desk and wait. Um, so who primarily you need at least to have your primary and your secondary um, backup. Um, you need to know about everything, storage and handling, um, um, rotating inventory, everything. Um, everything. Everything, just everything. Yeah, and oh, remember, okay. we, we need to do it at least every year for VFC, we need, right? Correct. We need to do it at least every year for VFC, and then every time something changes, every time a new vaccine comes out, um, we can't assume that each new vaccine is going to have the same storage and handling rules as others. Um, when changes occur at a minimum every year, um, but every now and again, um, updating yourself is great. You put it as part of new employee orientation. You can put it as part, um, for those who do performance planning, you can put it as part of professional development as part of, as part of your um, performance plan. Um, there's a lot of ways to put this into every day, what you do at work every day. So make sure that you have some sort of policies for new employee orientation, that every new employee gets it, no matter where they're working in that office. Make sure that every annually, there's some sort of a system to get it annually. And then every time there's recommendation changes or there's a new schedule, there are new vaccines come on or there's recommendation changes. Lots of training. Uh, tell us what goes in the fridge and what goes in the freezer. And I have to say, this makes me very excited that they both have Fahrenheit because for about 10 years, we've had the wrong slot pictures. So this is exciting. Yes. Um, so you've got to pick, you've got to pick a measurement. You're either Fahrenheit or centigrade. You don't, don't mix them because there's so many things you have to remember. There's no way you want to have two different temp measuring and this picture always had centigrade for freezer and Fahrenheit for the refrigerator. So I guess it's easier to say what needs to go in the freezer. Your varicella, your ProQuad must go in the freezer. Um, majority of folks will also store their um, MMR in the freezer um, because you're running out of room in your refrigerator, but um, you can store that in your freezer as well. Um, diluent for your vaccines do not go in the freezer or the refrigerator. They can sit on the shelf. And then all of your other vaccines are refrigerated. Um, and why do we have the bottled water in there? So, so for two, two reasons why we always put water. Number one is you put water bottles on the top shelf because you don't want to put your um, vaccine on the top shelf. Because routinely that's where your blower that's where it blows the cold air. And so sometimes stuff on the top shelf is more likely to freeze. And once that you cannot freeze vaccine, that is more, that is very dangerous. Once you freeze it, it's no longer effective. So first reason we put water bottles on the top shelf is that that's why we can't put vaccine. The second reason is because if your refrigerator goes out and we're moving into monsoon season, um, if your refrigerator goes out or you lose electricity for a short period of time, those water bottles will help maintain the temperature in the refrigerator and freezer. So that if it is a short power outage, you don't have to go into emergency mode and transport it. Um, you're just gonna keep the door shut. You're gonna have the external um, data logger temperature monitor so you can monitor it. Right. So, and write do not drink on them. <laughs> yes, do write yeah. do not drink on them. Yeah. Um, some practices have um, put some food coloring in there. You make it yellow and people don't tend to drink it, but just write do not drink. Oh, that's a great idea. The food coloring. Yeah. I learn something new every day. Yeah. 
So just because they're the new ones, let's just review storage for these okay. COVID vaccines. Um, so they're not finicky anymore. They're easy now. Yeah, they really have gotten much easier because um, you can refrigerate them um, for up to 30 days. I think it might actually even be a little longer now, but 30 days is, is a safe one. They can actually sit in your refrigerator. So there's no reason for anyone to rush out and buy an ultra cold freezer. I know there's some ultra cold freezers that are available that are countertop, but there's really no need to do that. You can store those in your refrigerator. Um, and Moderna. Moderna. Um, again, I'm, not much has changed here with this. Mm. Keep it in the freezer. Um, up until the expiration date, I'm punctured. You can keep it in um, your refrigerator again for up to 30 days. Do not refreeze thawed vaccine. And you already talked about punctured vials, so. I talked to, talk about punctured vials, yep. Yeah, so <laughs> Robin's asking back to the, the water bottles. What if your fridge is small and vaccines are on the top shelf? The indicator is not stating the fridge is out of range. Is she okay? Um. Still not to be, if you for VFC vaccine, it cannot be stored on the top shelf. So on your VFC audit, you will get in for that. Um, because the blower is on the top shelf, it is definitely, it, even though your refrigerator temp is not gonna be out of range, that top portion may be colder than the overall. Um, so the so right even if she's not VFC, I mean, the rule, we have to remember the, the VFC yeah. has, there's a lot of rules and accountability to, for a federal vaccine, but the so, rules are there to keep the vaccine safe. So correct. we follow those rules for every vaccine. So you would recommend to- I would recommend if at all possible, not put it on the top um, or just make sure that maybe, or maybe what you do is you have two, two temp monitor, you have two, two systems in there. And so you put something at the top underneath the blower to see maybe it's not going to get to 32 degrees. Um, oh, like, so a maybe like a two, Temp like a data logger than a temperature monitor for that just to measure it. Um, so you can be ensured that it doesn't get down to freezing. Um, but definitely for VFC on VFC audit, when they come in to check, they will ding you for that. So it does definitely not need to be there. Thank you. Uh, we always, and you know, you mentioned monsoon season and fire season is, um, well, fire season is a, a lot more than it ever has been. It feels like it's really long now, um, but they're coming up. So we always want to hope for the best, but we always have to plan for the worst. Having these emergency um, storage and handling and transport plans are really important. So tell us, what do we do in the event of power outage? So first of all, what you want to do is make sure that you have a temp monitoring system so you can actually monitor. So if, it, if, it, if your electricity goes out, um, as long as you can monitor the units without opening them, just keep monitoring them. If you feel like you're getting into that danger zone where the electricity is not going to come back on and your tech is going to go out of range, then what you need to do is you need to have a plan. Um, you need to have a backup plan of where you can move vaccine. You need to have hard-sighted um, ice chest or vaccine or units where you could actually move the vaccine. Um, some tempered water bottles, ice packs, you need a data logger and transferring vaccine, um, and then move it to a VFC appropriate unit. Um, if you do have a temperature excursion, if you do have to move vaccine, you must notify VFC immediately. Um, right. And when I mean immediately, that's I believe Monday through Friday, eight to five. So please go ahead and move the vaccine if it's midnight and you're going to, you might waste it, please go ahead and move it and notify them in the morning. Um, if you have a temperature excursion, you're definitely gonna call VFC immediately during business hours. If it's non-VFC vaccine, you're privately purchased, you're gonna call the vaccine manufacturer um, for those, each vaccines, and they'll talk you through it. They will talk you through, they're gonna ask you, um, what was the temperature, how long was it at that temperature, and then they'll be able to give you some recommendations. COVID-19 vaccine, again, you're gonna notify um, ADHS. And again, if the electricity goes out, just keep monitoring the temperature, don't open the door. 
Um, when I was a kid, my dad always used to say, stop opening the door. You're gonna melt my ice cream. Just leave it closed because it will maintain temperatures for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So we hear this a lot, like just what are general do's and don'ts for temp logs? Um, so first of all, you check twice a day. Um, you're gonna use the same measurement. Please either use centigrade or Fahrenheit. Um, it's much easier. Um, I always label each unit. So our refrigerators have a big label that say 36 to 46. And then our refrigerator, our freezer has the exact same label that says this is what the temperature should be. And that way, when you write down the temperature, you take a look to make sure that the temperature you wrote down actually fits in that range. That is just really helpful because when people get really busy and when you're short staffed, it's very simple to write down a number um, that is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that just makes it much easier. Yeah, we're going to launch this poll because it's just fun to see what are all of the mistakes that you have seen. We are all about improving and we can't improve unless we say out loud what our mistakes are. Um, one that, uh, so select all of the ones that you've seen of these different kinds of errors, but one that I see a lot, Macrina, and I don't even know if this is on the option, but or on the options is people writing down temps out of range and doing nothing about it. Correct. Yeah. Honestly, that is the biggest, and, and this is an error that I have seen happen. I have worked with someone for, we have been colleagues for over 20 years, and they had to move vaccine to a unit um, that had to be monitored by someone that was not her or her staff. And she just you know, she, she did everything I talked about. She put the temperature up there, but missed that training piece about how important the temperature was. And um, for four weeks, they documented temperatures between 28 and 31 degrees for the refrigerated vaccines. Yeah. Um, that is probably the most common error that happens. Because again, we're all short staffed, we're all busy. We're all trying to do multiple things. And so by having that, big label right above the, the, the daily write down the temperature sheet is so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that happens is, is sometimes, you know, you take vaccines out, you take the box of vaccine out to prep it, and then you're in a hurry or someone, or someone asks you a question and you turn around and you answer and you put them back and you put your varicella in the refrigerator and you put your HPV in the freezer. Um, so again, it's always double check. Those and the deal you went in the wrong place too is another. Yeah. So uh, can I say something? I yeah. think probably one of the best investments that frankly was not that expensive was using a company. Um, we use SmartSense and they basically, they specialize in refrigerator like units like at you know grocery stores and markets and stuff but they also um i through the pete's pal program the um that i use for discounts they offered for vaccines and we use them and you know i get texts i get phone calls you know like i can set it up any way i want to be alerted and then i have multiple people that are alerted you know on sunday my office manager came in and defrosted our freezer and so i got a text that the temperature was at three degrees and I was like "Ooh, you know it's usually at like negative 20 right and so mm -hmm. then I and I was at church um and then I got another text that it was 4.6 and I was like oh no and so I said I text her immediately because I knew she was getting the same text I was like I'm on my way to the office she goes oh I'm already here <laughs> and she was and I didn't know she was defrosting the freezer and so she's like this is the the vaccines are in our backup freezer and the backup monitor is reading negative 20 degrees she's like so I'm just waiting for this one to get to temp <laughs> yeah. so that's what it was but but I was getting these texts and and mm -hmm. when it's either not communicating with the internet or when it's reading the wrong mm -hmm. and one time I came in and and someone had um, left the refrigerator somehow it got like mm -hmm. left open a tiny bit 
and I knew immediately it just I kept getting these texts and it was going higher and higher and I came right in I shut it and within 15 minutes it was back to temperature um you know and we fill out the excursions and we explain what happened and they're safe you know and then we get a phone call they're fine to use go ahead you're good um but even on this one we filled out an excursion form for it because you know that was our original right. temperature thing but yeah I would say if you haven't and if you don't have a monitoring company you should do it it makes life so much easier and make yeah, sure like what you do that there's multiple people that get right. that text because if you are camping yeah you know or you are out of cell phone range or you're macrina and go to switzerland <laughs> i last yeah. week i was camping and i had zero service yeah, for four days right, zero right. service we but i a, knew yeah we use Senso scientific which does the same thing um, and I, my husband always says I have the world's most dysfunctional relationship with my refrigerator and freezer units because they will call, they will text, they will email. If the internet goes down, um, it just, you can go on and check is there a, because I have multiple sites. So you can go, if you're a county health department or some of these multiple sites, you can go on and see APS or SRP, whoever your um, electric company is. You can see, is there an outage? Yeah. They're very- it's like Jennifer's using that same sense. Uh, yeah. the sense of scientific too yeah and the nice um, thing with ours is that we have a subscription plan so instead of having to calibrate which can be very expensive um we just have it and that we automatically get new the company comes out and automatically puts new calibrated probes in every single one of them and so we don't have to recalibrate um it, it actually is is absolutely is a lifesaver and so if you don't have one <laughs> Talk to your practice manager, make sure that you can get one. It looks like a lot of people also see vaccines left unattended on the counter. I've heard horror stories about that. People walking in on Monday morning and there's a box mm -hmm. of vaccines. Um, yes. get, that really speaks to why it's important that everyone in that office has the training annually too, because the, the folks at the front desk need to know uh, those shipments. Another popular one looks like documenting and not taking action and not using vaccine that is soonest to expire first. So remember to rotate your vaccine um, and train people to rotate your, your vaccine, leaving the freezer door open, jawing it up too soon, and then it sits on the counter too long. Uh, well, most of these things that errors that we have are can be fixed in like with appropriate training for sure, but also with standard operating procedures. You know, we want to make sure that you write down who does what and when and how frequently. Uh, ADHS has their ops guide for the VFC program. Again, VFC vaccine, the vaccine does not know who's paying for the dose that goes in the arm. You know, you treat all your vaccine equally. Uh, those protocols are, those rules are in place to keep that vaccine safe. So they have some SOP in the ops guide. And remember that CDC has their vaccine storage and handling toolkit and the you call the shots stuff as well. Um, and I think they do those training trainings annually, right? The CDC. Right. You right. call the shots. So you, whenever you do your VFC re-enrollment, you need to put the um, certificates for both um, your primary and backup. Okay. Yeah. So again, like there's that way that that program is helping you adhere to just what's best practice too. So um, I, so key takeaways, train your staff, write down what everyone is supposed to be doing, have your standard operating procedures, clearly define roles and responsibilities. One of the biggest things that we see is that the VFC coordinator gets better job somewhere else. <laughs> um, wins the lottery, lottery. The not come in, you know, and no one else knows how to do the, that person's job. So be sure to make sure that you have a backup if you're the VFC coordinator. Um, we have some job action sheets if that would help you. And be sure that you have that emergency plan documented. I We put in the chat here a link and we're going to put it, if we can put that in again for an evaluation. We have prizes for Everyone who does the evaluation, every practice is getting a brand new pink book, uh, which is very exciting um, right here. So the pink book, which is your Bible of vaccine preventable diseases. Um, so please put, if you fill out the evaluation, you'll get that. And we also want to make sure that 
that if you are willing to talk for five or 10 minutes, you have, it could be three minutes. You know, I have something that we tried that was really great. And we want to be able to share that with other people. Please put it on that evaluation because we just think it is so much better when you hear from each other. Um, Macrina's office looks very different than yours. It's not a private practice. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even have exam rooms in all of her in all of her vaccine clinics, you know, with tables. So it looks very different. It's much better if we can hear from all of you. And did I forget anything? And we have fun prizes, lunch pails, fancy, fancy bottles of water, and of course our vaccine t-shirts too. So anything else that I forgot, Macrina? Because I know we're at time. Um no, not that I can think of. Please make sure you protect that cold chain. There are, you know, thousands of people who've had a hand in getting that vaccine into your office before you, um, and you don't want to be the reason why it's now not safe. So, and you certainly don't want to ever have to call in a few hundred patients because you found out that vaccine was kept out of the right, you know, at the wrong temp. So thank you guys so much for everything that you do. We'll keep the line open for just a little bit of time so that you can, if there's other questions, but um, otherwise we will see you in July and we'll talk about, uh, I think team-based care next month. All right. Uh, Angela's saying VFC re-enrollment is open. That's a good reminder. Actually, let's make sure we make a note to put a slide for that for next month. Uh, where do you do the evaluation? Let me put it, I will, here it is. Dr. Smith, do you think that, um, are you gonna be giving babies vaccine, just your patients or like are the other pediatricians in your community also offering COVID vaccine? Um, I know one of the other offices is, um... I have not, um, I've had to turn down a couple like older kids that wanted their boosters mm -hmm. um, just because like I said, we're no longer doing the drive up, um, but I haven't decided yet. Yeah. Um, probably not. I'm probably gonna limit it to just our patients. Yeah. Like I said, it was, you know, they would drive up outside my office. Like we'd see the window and I would go and do the vaccines. I would create lists every morning. I would do cards. I would do all that. And in the summer, I'm here a lot less, you know, I try to take a little extra vacation time. And especially now that, you know, things are a little bit more back to normal, I've right. taken more time off. So it's just not feasible. So right. probably not. I mean, I yeah. feel like if there's a significant demand, like I probably will, because that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll wait and see. Well, most of the, most of the families who are probably like, really excited about this or already your patient? I mean, you would think, think they're so. going to the practice that requires vaccines. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think, I don't think we're going to see the same rush that we saw when they open it up to five and over. No, unfortunately. Huh. I've, I have maybe like, I can think of like a half dozen families that have been hounding me. When are they going to get it for the babies? When are they going to get it for the babies? But mm -hmm. that's it. So I think we'll get more that will do it, but I just don't think it's going to be the same. Right. And the nice thing is we see those kids more frequently too. So I think they'll come do it uh, when they're already due for a well visit or due to come in. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't that think- an be... That's an excellent point. It doesn't make me so scared now. Cause you're right, Dr. Smith, we're going to see those patients a lot more. Cause they're- Oh yeah, you see them, those little ones yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I know the pharmacies, they will not, they can only do age three and up. So they- Well, see, and our pharmacies have been telling patients only 12 and up. So, so that's that another be, reason yeah. that I kept it open for so long for five to 12 is because the pharmacies won't even around here won't do it for 12 and up. So I don't know, I don't know, maybe I need to reach out to the pharmacies and be like, why are you telling patients this? Or if it's just the pharmacist's comfort level, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything we could do um, to help with training pharmacists or anything, let us know. Um, I mean, other than that would help, but. a screaming kid, I don't see how it's any different between five and 12 and 12 yeah. and up, you know? What? Um, They're easier to hold down. <laughs> what pharmacies are in your community? Uh, we have CVS, 
Walgreens, um, Fry's, Safeway. Okay. I'm trying to think who else. Those are the big ones. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's convenient, the pharmacy, you know, for those older kids, but yeah, I think three-year-olds, they're going to, I mean, most, all the data is saying that people want to hear from their doctor. Yeah. I mean, even when, with the pediatric, some of the sites in my community that did like big events for five-year-olds, they would show up, get in the drive through line and be like, uh, is Dr. Smith here? I, I just had a few <laughs> questions because she knows my, my kid, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It, it was fun. I mean, the car was like a challenge, but it was also good. Like kids in car seats were super That's easy to vaccinate. But then you had those kids that were jumping like the seats and mm -hmm. going and hiding in the trunk and stuff. Yeah. And so that was kind of hard. I'm like, all right, let's do this. I got patience. Let's go. <laughs> Anybody else have questions or stuffs? All right. Well, I guess we will sign off till next month when it's even hotter in Phoenix. <laughs> we can imagine. Yeah. So, uh, thank you all for everything that you do. Enjoy your pre back to school rush. Um, we will uh, see you all next month. Bye bye. <laughs>